Let's turn then to Romans 5, and uh, we'll read from verse 6 as far as verse 11. And verse 7 is really the text for this morning. Um, We'll also refer to verse 8. But we'll put these two verses then in context, 6 through to 11 of Romans 5. For when we were still without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Now, scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man, someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So much more then, having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. So verse 7 then, For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. Let's ask God then to help us hear his word. Lord our God, we come together again this morning to take the greatest theme that we could ever, ever consider, and that is your own love for us, the love of our God for his people. Lord, there's nothing greater, there's nothing that is more surprising, there is nothing deeper, there is nothing that is so wonderful as your love for your people. And Lord, in recent weeks we've learned that it is your love for sinners. And our minds are very clever at playing tricks. And Lord, we hear about your love and we can trick ourselves into thinking that your love is for us because we are your people or because we are Christians. But Lord, your love was demonstrated in that while we were still sinners. And so, our God, the greatest statement about your love is that you love sinners. So, Lord, we want to understand more of this this morning. Lord, this is the very foundation of our Christian lives. And we want the foundation to be solid and unshakable. So, Lord, we ask you to help us then by the power of your Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. So, I'm sure all of us remember then that in Romans 5, Paul is teaching the nature of the love of God. And I wonder if you remember that there are three challenges in these 11 verses to our enjoyment of our relationship with God. The first of them is sin, and Paul's got much more to say about the sin that continues to be the Christian struggle. So from verse 12 uh, and into chapter 6 and 7, he's got so much more to say about how as Christians we make sense of our daily struggle with sin. So sin is the first thing that he identifies. And then, do you remember, looking at verses 2 and 3, we have this idea of tribulation. Now, we will, I think, consider this subject in more detail in the weeks to come. But just as a a way of giving you some advanced notice, there's a difference between the way Christians understand tribulation 
and the way that the world understands it. So let's use a different word. Let's use the word suffering. The Bible tells us that the job of governments and society is to do everything possible to get rid of suffering. So it's very clear in the New Testament that governments are tasked by God to use all their power and all their resources to eliminate suffering from the world. But the Christian has a different take on suffering. And the Christian isn't called to get rid of it. The Christian isn't called to ask God to get rid of it. The Christian understands that in the hands of God, suffering has a holy purpose. Now, that's a radical difference to the way the world views suffering. So just take a moment to think about the past week and what you've noticed on the news. And every item raises this question that we should do all that we can to get rid of suffering, whether it's the suffering of children, whether it's the suffering because of war, whether it's suffering because of climate change. You'll hear again and again this message that we must all do all that we can to get rid of suffering. And that's absolutely right in the context of society. But both Paul here in uh, verse 3 and John will say that the Christian has a unique knowledge in relation to suffering. It's only the Christian that knows how suffering in the hands of God, works, works in the lives of Christians for glory. Well, we'll see more of that in the weeks to come. So, suffering, and then do you remember the third problem to our relationship with God? It's in these opening five verses, and it's the idea in verse five of disappointment. If you come to to prayer meeting on a Monday, you'll know that we are so often praying for the same things. We'll pray tomorrow for what we prayed last Monday, for what we prayed last year, for what we prayed 10 years ago. We are praying that God would add to our congregation those he wants to save. We are praying that God would bring Christians among us. We are praying for our children, our grandchildren, our great-grandchildren. We continue to pray, don't we, for husbands who are unsaved, for parents who are unsaved. And week after week, here we are praying for the same things. And the great challenge is to continue to do so in hope. Because there is this constant pressure of unanswered praise. And that in turn can lead to a believer feeling a sense of disappointment. Things aren't working out as we have hoped for. Things aren't happening that we have prayed for. And so there's this challenge that to continue hoping and to resist disappointment. Now, these are the three things then that Paul sets out here in Romans 5 as challenges to our experience of peace with God, rejoicing in God and in what he has done. Now, what's the great answer to sin? And the great truth is love. It is the love of God that is the ultimate answer to our sinfulness. And as we struggle with sin, as we fail, and as we make mistakes, we answer that struggle with the love of God. 
Now, let me just test something out here. How many times when you sin or fail do you make a promise to God? You promise not to do it again. Or you promise to try harder. Or you promise to make more effort. And you respond to your own mistakes by making a promise to God. Now, if you do that, I want to say to you very gently that you're making a terrible mistake. You don't respond to your mistakes by making more promises. You respond to any mistake that you make with love. Not your love, but God's love. God's love for you is how you respond to any mistakes you make. As soon as you feel you've failed or you've done something wrong, you remind yourself of God's love. God's love for you is how you answer the ongoing struggle with your sin. So let's come to our text. And what Paul is doing, do you remember, he's saying that the best light, the best view we get of God's love for us is when we go to the cross. And at the cross, we see in all its glory the love that God has for you and me because at the cross, we see God's love for sinners. So Paul is, is convincing his audience that God loves them as sinners and that that love is shown at the cross. Now, <clears throat> can I just take a moment to ask you to notice how Paul teaches these Romans. Do you remember he's never met them? When Paul writes this letter, he's probably in uh, what's called modern-day Albania. And uh, he's writing from Albania, and he wants to go to Spain. So Paul has this, this idea that if he leaves Albania, he can travel to Rome, and then from Rome, he can travel to Spain. But he wants the church at Rome to support him. So he wants money and help from the church at Rome to go to Spain. Now, he doesn't know the church. He wasn't used to found the church like he was in Corinth or Ephesus or Athens. So he writes this letter to introduce himself to get their support. And what Paul puts on display in this letter is the glory of our salvation. And Paul draws on every tool available to him in writing to this church to teach them the wonders of God's salvation. So can I ask you just for a moment to think of Paul as a teacher? Now, Paul, uh, we are told, uh, was trained by Gamaliel. And Paul learned different ways to be an effective teacher. Paul knows how to construct an argument. Paul is very good at making his point and putting his point in such a way as to make it memorable. And there are a number of techniques that Paul has to show to his audience the point that he is making. So, so do some of you remember, what are the, the techniques that Paul uses when he's teaching? So I want you to imagine Paul uh, in a classroom and imagine the Romans as people in his class and he's teaching them. And uh, in Romans 5, he's teaching them about the love of God. And Paul wants to establish his, his teaching by using some techniques that he's learned. So do any of you remember 
the techniques that Paul uses in making his case. Well, turn over to Romans 8 for a second, and I'll remind you of one of them. So look at verse 32 of Romans 8, and there is Paul using one of the techniques he's learned when he wants to to make his point. Do you remember what it is? Romans 8 and verse 32. He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not, along with him, freely give us all things? Can you see the technique there? Paul gives the greater statement, he did not spare his own son. Talking of God, Paul tells us that God has done the greatest thing in giving his son for us. Now, if God has done the greatest thing, God will also do lesser things, giving us all things. So that technique is called going from the greater to the lesser. You make a greater statement, and then based on that greater statement, you make a lesser statement. That's what Paul is doing in Romans 8. Now come back to Romans 5 and verse 7. And what is he doing here? So read the verse again and ask the question, what technique is Paul using? He wants to establish the truth of the love of God. He wants to convince us of the greatness of the love of God. So what technique is he using? For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man some would even dare to die. So can you identify the technique? Romans 8, you've got the greater to the lesser. In Romans 5 and verse 7, you have the lesser to the greater. You start with a lesser truth, and then you move from the lesser truth to the greater truth. If the lesser is true, then how much more is the greater truth true? Do you see it there? And I want us to spend our time this morning just noticing Paul's technique in Romans 5 verse 7. So this is what Paul does. He wants to begin by talking about human love. And he wants you to imagine human love in a certain context. And then, having established that, he'll then take us from human love to God's love. And he'll show us how much greater God's love is compared to human love. So starting with human love, he then moves to God's love. So let's follow Paul in Romans 5 verse 7 then. So imagine him the teacher. You are in his classroom and he asks the question, under what circumstances would you be prepared to die from love? Under what circumstances? So what Paul does, first of all, is he rules out family. It's completely taken for granted that we love our families. It's completely ordinary that we love our families. There's nothing remarkable, nothing exceptional about loving your family. That's taken for granted. And it's completely taken for granted that you would die for your family. Nothing unusual about that at all as far as Paul is concerned. And in fact, Paul would even go as far as to say it's completely uninteresting that you would love your families and that you would die for them. It's so uninteresting that he doesn't even mention it. 
So his question is, under what circumstances would you be prepared out of love to die for someone else? Now that's the question that he puts to his audience. And I want you to consider that question for yourselves. Under what circumstances would you be prepared to die for another? And that other is not a member of your family. In fact, what Paul does is he takes it a step further and he says you have no connection to this other person at all. So this other person isn't a friend, he's not a neighbour, he's not perhaps even a member of your community, he's certainly not a member of the church, so this person is a complete stranger to you. Under what circumstances would you be prepared from love to die for a complete stranger? That's his question. And uh, Paul strikes me in verse 7 as, as a bit of a philosophy teacher. He's posing a problem for us to consider. And he wants to generate a discussion. So under what circumstances? Will you die for a complete stranger? That's his question to you. And as you look at the way he puts it in verse 7, he uses the word scarcely. So he's, he's telling us that many, many people would answer that question by saying, never, I would never consider dying for a stranger. I'd never entertain the idea, would be some of the responses Paul would get from his students. And if some in the classroom say, Paul, I would never do it, Paul would say, fine, you've got no reason to. Nobody could compel you. Nobody would force you. Nobody would think the worst of you if you refused to die for a complete stranger. Why should you? Is what Paul is implying here in the word scarcely. So many would do nothing. And then as you go down into verse 7, you can almost imagine in, in his classroom, a, a lot of the students have said never, we'd never do it. But one or two would say, well, well I could imagine a situation in which I might be prepared to die for a complete stranger. So one or two hands, if you like, are going up. And they're saying, Paul, I can think of a situation in which I would be prepared to die for a stranger. Can you see it in verse 7? Scarcely for a righteous man would one die. Yet perhaps for a good man, someone would even dare to die. So a hand has gone up and a little voice is being raised. Paul, I could imagine that I could die for a stranger if that stranger was a good man. If he was exceptional in some way. Perhaps if that stranger was a genius who had the cure for cancer. Or if that stranger was a, a, a wonderful person who had given all his money to charity and he's ill. I could imagine, says one little voice in Paul's classroom, saying, I could imagine giving my life if that stranger is better than me, more important than me, if his life 
is of greater significance than mine, if he's some great hero or some great champion or, or some great genius, then I could imagine, says this lone voice, under those circumstances, giving my life for such a one. Now, that's the technique Paul is using. He poses a question, under what circumstances would you be prepared to die? He then sets the rules. So the rules are, it's not family, it's not friends, it's not community members, it's not believers, it's no one that you know. Under those circumstances, when would you be prepared to sacrifice your own love for, and your own life for someone else? Now, the sense is the majority of people would not consider doing it for a second. And what we need to do, we need to take this from the classroom and we need to ask ourselves the honest question. Would you ever be prepared to die for a stranger? And I'm sure most of us would say, no, we wouldn't. We can see no circumstances under which we would give our lives freely for someone else who has nothing, no connections, no ties, no blood relationship with us. And I'm sure that's the honest truth about all of us here this morning. I doubt, and perhaps you disagree with me, I doubt there would be one hand raised in which, not in theory now, but in reality, we would say, yes, I could imagine a situation in which I would sacrifice myself for somebody who I didn't know. Even if he was righteous, even if he was good, even if he was very, very commendable and impressive, I cannot imagine. And that's the idea of verse 7, isn't it? Scarcely, we have at the start of the verse. And then perhaps we have in the middle of a verse, as Paul is setting out this argument, from experience. And that's the important thing of verse 7. It has to be a lesson from experience. And as you look at the end of verse 7, you've got a very rare word, rare in terms of the New Testament. And uh, the word is translated for me as day. Do you see it at the end of verse 7? I wonder what translations you have. It says at the end of verse 7, for a good man, someone would even day. Now, the word there is courage. Somebody would have the courage to die. Now, that's a very, almost a sort of sleight of hand uh, by the Apostle Paul because he's, he's talking about love and then he, he brings in courage. And he says, if somebody does sacrifice themselves for a stranger, then it would be courage. Courage is what's going on there. The courage to die for another. But it's not love. It's courage. That's what you'd see in human experience. And then you get to verse 8. And isn't it just a, a devastating contrast that really drives home the truth of God's love for us? So we mustn't miss it. So let's go back to Paul in the classroom. He's asked his students. One has said, yes, I would. I die for a stranger. And then Paul says, yes, you might, but it would be out of courage. It wouldn't be out of love. And then he says this, God demonstrates his love for us in that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. So the divine love, God's love, 
is a contrast to ours in as much as as high is a contrast to low. Do you see it? So back to human love. Human love (coughs) would have to be expressed by identifying the best person you could imagine. So here you are, and a stranger to you would have to be an exceptional person. He would have to be wonderfully different. He'd have to be very clever, very important. He'd have to be very rich. He'd have to be very influential for you to offer your life in exchange for his. He would have to be the highest human being imaginable. If we, out of courage, were to offer our lives. But the love of God is seen in that he goes to the lowest in human beings. God loves sinners. He loves the every. He loves the ordinary. He loves the basest, the lowest. In human beings. And that's the contrast in the love of God. Now, I do hope this morning you've had some sense of how this works. Because Paul is masterful at teaching us the wonders and the glories of the love of God. And he does here in verse 7 by starting with our own experience. And what's so interesting is he's not starting with our experience of sin. And he says, right, you feel yourself sinners. So I want to tell you about God. He doesn't do that. He starts with what's best in us. He starts with love and courage. And he says love and courage are amongst the best qualities in human beings. So how do these best qualities in human beings show themselves? Where is love in human beings seen at its best? Where is courage in human beings seen at its best? Now let me remind you, Love in human beings is not seen at its best in families because that's taken for granted. So when is love, human love, seen at its best? And when is human courage seen at its best? Well, Paul says it's very exceptional to see human love at its best. It's rare to see human courage at its best. In fact, you could go through your entire life and never see human love at its best and never come across human courage at its best. It's scarce. That's what he's saying in verse 7. It's rare. It's exceptional to see human love and human courage at its best. So let me remind you, when is human love seen at its best? When you'd be prepared to die for a stranger. That's when human love is seen at its best. And what sort of stranger would that be? Well, he'd have to be exceptional. He'd have to be good. He'd have to be righteous. And so human love, it's seen as it at its best when you die for someone good. You don't know him. You're not related to him. He's not your friend. He's a complete stranger. And human love is seen as its best. Human courage is seen at its best when you die for a stranger. And that stranger is a good man. 
Now then, by contrast, God's love is seen at its best when he sends his son to die for sinners. Nothing exceptional, nothing remarkable, nothing great about us. The very worst about us, the fact that we are sinners, that's how God shows his love at its best in the giving of his son to die for sinners. And that's the great contrast between human love and God's love. And there are times, aren't there, when we cheapen the idea of God's love, when we get a bit sentimental or we get a bit sloppy or a little bit wishy-washy about love and about God's love. God's love is seen at its best in loving sinners but God's love is seen at its best in the death of his son so there's nothing sentimental about God's love there's nothing light and fluffy there's nothing pink in the sky God's love embraces the realities of the cross of the wood and the nails and the despising and the rejecting. His love is expressed in the harsh realities of blood spilt on the cross, the blood of his only son, the one whom he had loved in eternity, the one through whom he had made the worlds. It's in that death the death of his only son for sinners that God's love is best seen. And we'll come in the weeks to come at the notion of blood in verse 9. We'll come to grapple with the idea of wrath in verse 10. We'll understand reconciliation and enemies as these verses unfold. But here's the heart of the idea. Human love at its best, God's love at its best. And God's love at its best takes the worst of human beings and offers his son for them. Human love at its best takes the best about human beings and offers courage and love as a sacrifice there is such a contrast and I guess we'll finish with this idea if we are ever to understand God's love for you and me we would do ourselves great good by reminding ourselves always that the way God loves is in contrast to the way we love and the more we understand that contrast, the greater our appreciation of the love of God will be. Well, let's pray together.